Good evening. Uh, this evening's uh, live event is on teaching the pilotage and passage plan in aspects of Powerboat Level 2. Uh, the video that uh, you will now see has been produced by Mr. Paul Brown, an RYA Powerboat trainer who helps us with RYA Powerboat instructor training. While the team's live event is happening, if you click at the top right of the screen, you'll be able to ask any questions which I will try to answer at the end of the event. The screen will now go blank while I set up the video. Hello and welcome to this session where we'll be looking at RWA Powerboat Level 2 and specifically what we need to teach in terms of pilotage and passage planning. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Paul Brown. I'm a volunteer with the Sea Cadets, currently a, a national boating advisor with the inshore boating team. And I'm an RWA Powerboat trainer and Yacht Master Cruising instructor. So in terms of pilotage planning then, What's the outcome for level two? What do we want our students to be able to do after a successful level two course? So they should be able to understand the basic concepts of passage and pilotage planning. What are they? Why do we need them? Know where to gather the necessary information. So what goes into these items and why and where do we get that from? They should be able to construct a simple pilotage plan and that's something we should give them as an exercise during the course. And they should have been able to have the opportunity to, to actually run through a pilotage plan on the water and see how it works in real life, having done the preparation. What kind of level of information do we need to get across to our students during the course? So for me, a little guide in terms of everything we teach at level two, I have this little example to think about to try and set the scene. So if we think about a family of four, they're new to boating, just bought their, their first powerboat, perhaps a rib, and they want to be able to take their children down to the local beach, maybe a mile or two away, and anchor up, stop for lunch, have a swim, and they're gonna be doing this by daylight and in fair weather. That little example is the kind of level that we're pitching to as an RYA level two. Obviously within the Sea Cadets, we have a vast variety of people coming that may have years worth of boating experience, some may be newer, but that's sort of the typical, you know, how the RYA are pitching the course and what they'd expect the level to be to, to be targeted at. So above all, I think the key message is, you know, that, that level is nothing like Day Skipper or Yacht Master. It really is simple. So, you know, don't overcomplicate it. Don't try and impress people with how much knowledge you have. Tell them exactly what they need to know, which is for level two, nothing particularly detailed. So we've talked about passage and pilotage planning. What are they and what is the difference? So the way I like to think about it, passage planning is the big picture. Technically, it's a SOLAS 5 requirement, SOLAS 5 being the safety of life at sea, and a, one of the few pieces of legislation that actually applies to us in the UK as leisure boaters. Obviously, there's not that many rules we have to follow as leisure boaters. We don't technically need to have a license or anything. But SOLAS 5 is a, an overarching piece of legislation that does apply to us. And it says, as a leisure boater, we should have a passage plan before we go afloat. So what do we need for a passage plan? Basic things, you know, where are we starting? Where are we hoping to go to? Or what's our operating area for the day if we're teaching a course? 
are there any dangers to be aware of along the route that we you know particularly need to call out a particularly shallow patch a dangerous wreck or rocks something like that that we want everyone on the on the boat or on the course to be aware of if we're doing a passage how long is it going to take or if we're just going out for some training how long are we going to be afloat for have we got enough fuel for that period obviously we need to make sure we have spare fuel so we're not you know running right to the edge is the weather suitable for the proposed passage are we happy that you know if we've got a couple of hours worth of passage is there a suitable weather window to meet that passage we obviously don't want to get halfway through and end up in a you know a, a massive storm what are the tides doing and how are they going to affect you if you're executing a passage are they going to be with you are they going to be against you what might happen if you're going around a headland might you get a tidal overfall effect or wind against tide something that might make the conditions in the sea state a lot rougher so little things like that that we need to think about is the boat and crew capable of undertaking the proposed passage so have we thought about you know who is actually going on the boat with you if you're proposing a passage of a number of miles are you happy they're confident and capable of doing that we obviously don't want to take people out of their comfort zone and potentially have a situation you know where they decide they need to get off the boat and a rescue is needed obvious things you know not an exhaustive list but have we got life jackets for everyone on board maybe a spare on board just in case one actually gets used have we got the appropriate safety equipment have the people got the appropriate clothing do they need wet weather gear do they need dry suits or wet suits things like that because obviously warm happy people on boats make a big difference as soon as people start to get cold and wet that's when things can start to go wrong do you need any food drinks even if just as an emergency i always take a few snacks and a bottle of water out in case you get stuck and you need to wait for assistance or something and what about ports of refuge or escape plans if you're doing a, a passage if you have a problem you know where can you stop on route are there any alternatives if you have to cut short whether you you're short of fuel or the weather turns nasty what are your potential options there something just worth thinking about and writing down a lot of this actually tallies these days with with what what's in the sea cadet ibos and many centers now you know basically have you write down a lot of this information on a, a sheet which is basically if it's not a passage it's information to think about before you go afloat for a teaching session and it tallies very closely with this information so this is just an example i pulled together which is similar to what i used to do at my training center and kind of the information and the the key pieces that you might need to write down so in this case i'm doing it as a passage i'm starting at pool i'm heading to weymouth that's roughly 27 miles as it goes if i do 27 knots on my rib that will take me about an hour and i plan to do it just after lunch i've checked the weather a force three southwest i'll be going pretty much southwest that's all right for me i've checked the tides at either end and i can check which direction they'll be going in around some of the the headlands and things to make sure i'm happy with that obviously we want to know how many people we're taking on the water with us i've got the boat name there should we need to to send either a for a rescue or so the people on the, the shore know which boats we've taken out and we've got an emergency contact as well and a phone number should someone in the center on the shore need to to raise some alarm and try and get hold of us we should try and log it in our way safe tracks as well that's the replacement for what was the the voluntary safety scheme cg66 operated by the coast guard and safe tracks is there's an app and a website and that allows you to, to log pretty much this kind of information. And if you're within mobile phone coverage, if you allow it to, it will grab your position from your phone's GPS and it will upload that as well occasionally so people can, can see where you are. You can set alarms in it. So if you're not, if you don't log in by a certain time to say you've arrived somewhere, it will start alerting your emergency contacts, whether that's family or the Sea Cadet Center so they can start to check and see what's going on and that's the little the view of the app from the RYA safe tracks it's free to download so definitely worth downloading and having a look and seeing what you make of it 
So that was passage planning. Pilotage planning is what I like to refer to as the fine detail at the start and the end of the trip. So how do we get out the little harbour to begin with? And how do I get into perhaps an unfamiliar harbour that I'm going to arrive in at the end of the trip? And this is using visual references. So what do I need to look at as I as I enter and leave these destinations? A harbour might have several navigable channels. Which one are we meant to use? There may be rules in terms of what sort of boat is allowed to use each channel. Maybe the commercial channels they would prefer you not to be in, especially if there's many commercial movements. Other things, hazards, shallow areas, commercial shipping. What else do we need to be aware of? Are there any depth restrictions to where you want to go to? Some marinas, for example, they may have sills or they may be situated in areas that you can't access at low water. So do we know of any res restrictions around that? Are there any lock gates that we need to open at certain times or bridges that need to lift? Any local bylaws to be aware of? So certain harbour authorities might have specific bylaws, local laws in place to say what you're allowed to do. They may set a specific speed limit. They may set different aspects specific to that harbour that we should know about in advance. What VHF channel does the harbour operate on if you want to hear what's going on with the commercial ship movements, for example? Speed limits we've touched on, prohibited areas. Are there any areas that as a leisure boater you shouldn't be transiting or going in? Perhaps either a military zone or potentially some of the, the commercial port areas where leisure boats are, are prohibited. And this is the sort of thing you obviously need to prepare before you leave the port. You can't do this as you go along. You need to have had a look at certain pieces of data and been able to look at the charts and work out exactly where you, you need to go. So this is definitely the homework before you, you go afloat. So where can we get some of this information we've talked about and what can we find? So detailed and up-to-date charts of the area, obviously easy to get hold of. Do make sure if you're using some charts you've got a, at home or in the unit, they are up to date. Chart corrections are issued online and you can apply them to your charts. And obviously certain things do move. Boys occasionally move, sandbanks shift. So make sure you are, before you go out, you are actually using a, a, a recently updated chart. Tide tables. So you can obviously get the traditional columns and rows. And these days, you know, I personally use Easy Tide online. That gives you seven days of, of tidal predictions in advance and shows you the, the bell curves and things as well. And there's various other apps out there, Boaty and the like, if you want to, to do something on your phone. For anyone that hasn't seen Easy Tide, it looks kind of like this. In this case, I've selected two days worth of tides to show. And down here, it gives you the the traditional table showing you the times of high water and low water. And then here it's got the, the graph so you can easily have a visual reference to see what's happening during the day. One thing to, to point out here, if you're using Easy Tide, watch out for this little fellow over here, the daylight savings. So obviously at the moment in the UK, it's July, we're in British summertime, which is daylight savings. You need to manually apply that. If you don't choose the correct time there and click apply, you will be an hour or two out on your tides. So if you're using Easy Tide, make sure you, you correctly apply daylight savings for the area you're in. The Nautical Almanac. So many people will have, be familiar with these wonderful big fat reeds, Nautical Almanacs. A very traditional way of doing it. Obviously, this book covers all of the UK, parts of Europe. You know, it's far more detailed than your average sea cadet course or centre is going to need. You might want two pages out of 500. So it's still a very good source of information, especially if you're on a more like a, a sailing yacht and you're going to different places. But it is an awful lot of information for a single location. But if you've got access to one, definitely worth looking at. And the way it presents the information is definitely worth familiarising yourself with because it puts it in certain orders and has a particular style and you know somewhat shorthand style in places. If you want to buy one, these are sort of £45 I think these days and they're issued every year to, so they can update the specific pieces of data that need changing. 
local harbour guides or the harbour website. So many harbour the harbours these days they issue free harbour guides. This is the one for Pool Harbour, which is my normal base. And it's actually a very good guide that includes little chartlets that show you where you can do certain activities and which are the preferred channels and things. And it's got some explanation around how to enter and leave the harbour, what the facilities are, what the different marinas or berth opportunities are. And given it's free, it's a, a very good guide. And many harbours these days operate a similar kind of scheme. Online resources, Visit My Harbour is one I tend to use if I'm going somewhere unfamiliar, or especially if you're trailering a boat, boatlaunch.co.uk tell, tells you a bit about the, the different slipways. And Visit My Harbour, this is just a little screenshot of pool. It actually has some charts you can look at online, which are, are particularly handy if you don't have the charts of instantly available at home. And then there's various commentaries about different places you can go, some of the, the author's favourite places and how you can approach and leave the harbour safely. Pilotage guidebooks, so a little bit more traditional and perhaps more yachty, but things like this, the Shell Channel pilot covers the south coast of the UK and across into France. This is a quite a detailed book with a lot of description in it by the author who's sailed into many different places and he describes for you in quite a lot of detail how you enter it safely, what the different navigational marks are or anything like a leading line or a transit and tells you a little bit about the, the port or the place as well and what you might expect to find. So again, like the Almanac, it's a relatively expensive book that covers quite a wide area, but definitely if you have one available, worth having a look at and just seeing what sort of information you get in them. Local yachts and sailing clubs. So if you, you remember or you've got a friend there, you know, obviously if you ask them, most of the time they will very happily tell you about their harbour and their locality and what the different opportunities are. So that sort of local knowledge, local contact thing is always worth using. Google Earth. So personally, if I'm going into an unfamiliar harbour, Google Earth might actually be slightly more up to date than some of the charts that are available. So personally, I tend to Google Earth it as well. And that very easily shows where specific shallow areas are, where the deep water is, especially with some small ports where maybe the charts aren't as detailed as you'd like. So it's always worth a scan of that given it's so easy these days. And then what do we need to do? So we need to gather all this information, grab the pen and paper and start coming up with a plan that we can take out on the water. Obviously we can't take all of the above books and things out, we'll be taking a bit of a library with us, so we need to summarise and condense this down into a nice piece of paper that we can easily refer to while we're helming a small open powerboat. So building a plan. I'm assuming as part of the chart work, we've already covered things like measuring bearings and distances, basic tidal knowledge, voyage, things like that. And we're basically building all that up together. We need to pull it all together and produce a little pilotage plan. The standard RYA operating area is a maximum of three navigable miles from the centre. So we don't need to be, again, this isn't Yachtmaster, we don't need to be having them plan passages from Poole to Weymouth, which is 27 miles. You're never going to do that on a level two course. What you might do is get out of harbour and go one or two miles out and then turn around and come back. So it's not about big distances, you only need to hop down a couple of boys just to show how you do this navigational piece and what they can expect to find. Think about how this fits in the course plan as well. Is it something you can fit in such that there's a stop at the end of the pilotage exercise and you can maybe practice anchoring and fit in your compass work, taking a three point fix or maybe have a stop for lunch? In certain areas, you might need to transit out of the, the port to be able to do the planing speed work. So have a think at which centre you're operating at and how this best fits into the, the course plan. And that will vary centre by centre and even course by course, depending on the tides at certain locations. So this is Pool Harbour. This is the chart that I've pulled off and marked up. And the red line is my what I'm hoping to do for my pilotage plan. So if I swap colours there, we're starting here at, at what's called Poolkey Boathaven. 
and I want to transit out the harbour entrances just down the bottom right down here. I want to transit out towards that kind of area. So in this case, I've read the Almanac and I've looked at the various other resources I've got at my disposal. And there's a number of things we need to look at here. So in the middle of the, the chart there, we've got what's called the middle ship channel. And that is the main commercial shipping channel that's dredged. You can tell from its colour, it's a nice deep channel. But actually, I know in Poole, having read my, my documents, the harbour master would rather we don't use that. There's actually something called a small ships channel, which goes down this side between the, the red boys at the top and these little red posts here. And that's specifically there for small ships and yachts like us, so we can keep out of the main shipping channel and avoid the commercial movements. So what I've chosen to do is cross the main channel nicely and get into what's called the small ships channel. And it's something like that, unless you've looked at that in advance, there's not road signs, as it were, pointing that out on the water. We need to have looked that up up front. Obviously, other things to note, if you drifted too far south of the of the small ships channel, you notice all these areas of green drying heights. There's actually quite a few sandbanks over there. And since this electronic chart was made, they've actually shifted a bit. So, you know, where are the, the shallow areas you need to be aware of or any other hazards? What about speed limits? I happen to know that up at the top end here in the port area, this is actually all a six knot speed limit and minimal wash. Once you get out into the middle ship channel and past this boy here, Stakes Boy, then it's a 10 knot speed limit in most of the harbour. And little things like that we need to know about. So once we've done the background research then we can actually build our plan. And what I tend to do is exactly what you've seen here. I get the chart out, we can put lines on it to show exactly where we want to go, which channels we want to use, which boys we're going to, to help use us or other features to help navigate. And we can draw our planned course on the chart. And we can then, referring back to the chart work lesson, we can get out our Portland plotters and our dividers, and we can measure some of the, the bearings and distances between these different marks that we want to use. And we can start to then build that into a into an actual plan that we can take out on the water with us. But some people will ask, you know, why are we bothering to do all this? Why don't we just take the chart out with us? But actually trying to refer to the chart as you go along is just pretty much impossible. You know, it's, it's got far too much detail on it for you to easily glance as you're driving along in a, a small open powerboat. So what we're really trying to do here with a pilotage plan is condense down the minimal amount of information you need in a format that is very easily readable and visualizable from the water, such that you've got a very easy reference to look at as you go along. Okay, this is the equivalent Google Earth and I've sort of superimposed the, the planned route on it as well. And as we were saying, you can kind of see here, so these are all the sandbanks that are were just south of the route. If you happen to, to go over towards the North Channel again, you can see there's lots of sandbanks here. So it's the standard pub quiz question around here, what's the average depth of, of water in Pool Harbour? And the answer is about 48 centimetres. So it is a particularly shallow harbour as you go outside of the, the Mark channels. And even in a rib, 48 centimetres isn't that much, even by the time you've added a bit of tide. So it's definitely something you need to be, be careful of and aware of. So in some cases, especially if you've looked at any sort of day skipper yacht mastery type books, you may see a pilotage plan that's what I would call in a tabular format. So it very much has different waypoints. So you've got things like the start point and an end point, and you've measured out the course and the distance and put in any other information you might need. In this case, there was a six knot speed limit. And then that boy goes there, so that becomes the new start point, and then you've got another end point, course and distance again. Other information we've got here, tidal information, obviously very important, so we know what way the tide's going and we know how deep it is. Anything we need to know in terms of VHF channels, so in this case, VHF channel 14 is Pool Harbour Control, 
and that's where they announce all the commercial shipping movements. For anyone that hasn't been there, Poole Harbour actually has a chain ferry that goes backwards and forwards at the harbour entrance. You're required to give way to it. And obviously there's chains running underneath it as well. You don't want to go too close to either end of it and catch the chain. So something like that we should be aware of. And in general, in much of the open harbour, the speed limit is 10 knots. So I've said down at the bottom there, this style, you do see it in certain older textbooks and in some of the day skippery yacht mastery type stuff. When you're sitting at a chart table and things, OK, maybe it's reasonable. But when you're bouncing up and down on a small open rib and the wind's blowing you in the face, you really can't visualise this and turn it into a plan. So there's actually a, a much better way of doing this as well. And it's what we call the visual approach. And this is Blue Peter style, something I prepared earlier. My artwork is not impressive, so apologies for that. But this is what I would call a very standard interpretation of the information we saw on the chart. So we were starting up here. I've got my six knot speed limit. I've got bearing and distance. I've personally chosen to put time on here as well. If you have a, a GPS on board and it's got a, a log feature, you can use the distance tracking feature of that as well. And that's obviously a bit more accurate than sitting there looking at your watch counting. But I like to keep the time there so it just leaves roughly how long do I expect it to go. And not all the boats you use at level two, especially in the sea cadets, have built in GPSs on them and chart plotters. I've put the different boys here. I draw them much as you know, you'd see them on the chart. So Stakes boy is a, a southerly cardinal. These are green posts with conical top marks. And then we cross the channel down here and we start to see different boys. So you can see here, I've drawn a straight line. We're not hopping from boy to boy. We're not going 28 to 26 to 24. We're drawing a straight line as much as we can. And I've put in here out of interest so you can see that as we do this particular heading course of 120 degrees for a mile, we will start to pass a number of different buoys that we can then use as checkpoints and you can cross those off as you go along. So some people would laminate this card as well and then have a like a China graph pencil and you can cross things off as you go so you know exactly where you are. Down here we've got the little red posts that mark the southern side of the small ship channel and here was the sand bank that you don't want to go any further beyond those posts because it does get very shallow. Again, we've got a cardinal mark, in this case, an easterly cardinal mark that's got a name, Aunt Betty, and you can see that written on it as you go past and mark it off. And then we change course and head slightly further south to bend around the end of Brownsea Island. Other features you might see, so as you get around here, there's a very conspicuous castle on the end of Brownsea Island. So, you know, obviously, as you start to see that, it's a, a very good landmark to use. You can see the different marinas and yacht clubs around the, the northern end and the eastern end of the harbours very easily. So again, good references to use. And different marks as we go down here again, we'll be passing them and we can count them off. Over in the bottom left, I've put again, similar to the, the tabular format, the tidal information. I've got the VHF information and other navigation information that is worth knowing. So this is a little example. This is just the, the style that I personally prefer. I find it works really well. And again, don't go overboard with the information. You obviously don't want to make it too cluttered. You want to make it very easy to refer to. So as you're going along on your rib, you might be doing 10 knots, maybe 15 knots if you were outside the harbour. And you need to be able to easily look at it and not sit there peering, trying to find very small little numbers hidden amongst lots of different lines and artifacts and things. You can obviously use different colours in your pilotage plan as well. For example, if you want to you know, use the correct colours for, for each of the boys, so they're you know, very easy visual references that match exactly what you'll see in real life. And you can obviously colour things like the water as well to show the, you know, the expected depths to match the sort of the standard colours we'd see on the chart. Personally, I find, especially if I do quite a lot of night navigation, I find it much easier just to have the, the single dark colour. But by day, you know, basically redrawing and using the colours of the chart can make it much more like what you, you expect to see and much easier to refer to. Some people, I said before, some people would then laminate this. 
if you're going in and out of a harbour a lot. And you can then obviously take it with you, use something like a China graph pencil or a whiteboard marker, and you can adjust it as you need to for each day. You can add in the tidal information for that day on the side, and then you don't need to keep drawing the same harbour pilotage plan over and over again. And if you're going in and out there infrequently, it might be something you want to refer to just so you don't forget it if it's maybe once a year you teach in, in that location. So if you're teaching this inland, obviously it's a lot harder if there's no commercially available chart, but we can make our own. So if you have some boys there, there may already be some, or if not, the centre will, will no doubt have some marks that are suitable. We can lay some boys. You can use either a, a handheld little Garmin GPS or something, or these days various phone apps if you've got GPS on your phone. And you can get the lat long of those boys if you drop them in and either use the handheld GPS or your phone. You can measure the bearing and distance between them. And then if you use something like Google Earth, that will let you plot the positions and put little boys on a Google Earth map and then create a map that you can print off and give to the students. And that's then we can follow the, the same as we've just done in the previous example, and they can construct a simple pilotage plan. You can obviously write a little mini almanac of your own for the, for the lake or the dock to highlight anything else they need to know about in terms of speed limits, Maybe there's other sailing clubs there and there's specific rules about how you interact with them and things like that. And that gives them, you know, the best we can do on a, an inland waterway so they know what sort of things to, to look at. So next steps then, go and practice this for yourself at home. Obviously, any chart will do. It doesn't have to be up to date if you're just having a practice and seeing what information you can glean from it. You can look up some additional data online if that's the, the best resource you've got available and practice making your own pilotage plan. So start to look at how you draw the, the key information off the chart and get it into your own diagram. That's what we need to teach the students to do and we don't have that much time to do it in a level two course. Make sure your own chart knowledge is up to scratch so there'll be something in the Google Classroom on that but you need to make sure you're happy with things like the colours, the dangers, the key symbols, measuring distances and bearings, and checking and calculating latitude and longitude. Before you teach this subject in a new operating area, make sure you have done your homework first. You are familiar with the area. You know the, the ins and outs of the, the local bylaws, the speed limits, things like that. And you've produced your own pilotage plan. You know, obviously, if you walk into there as a, a brand new instructor to a new area and you don't actually know the background yourself, it's not going to make it very easy for you to, to teach that and validate what your students are, are suggesting they might want to do. If you're teaching at a new centre and location, they should offer you as part of the RYA induction to a centre a detailed familiarisation. If they don't, make sure you ask for that and get them to take you out on the water and show you what you can do in this area, where the different teaching areas they recommend to use for the different aspects of the course and you're happy with the navigation, especially if that's a, a coastal venue you haven't been to before and it's perhaps a bit more challenging an environment than some of the inland waters we use. And definitely do that before you teach your first course. So finally, there is a quiz on pilotage and passage planning in the Google Classroom. So why don't you go and test your knowledge? and see what you what you know. Thank you. Right, I'm just going to turn the video off and uh, I will then set up another presentation. OK, if there are any questions on uh, what Paul said, uh, please uh, type them in on the right hand side or there's an opportunity to uh, review or have another look at this presentation. Uh, 
Um, we have done, as Paul said, a number of follow up classes and exercises, and they are on Google Classroom. A copy of this webinar will also be put on the uh, Google Classroom. And the access code for the Google Classroom is Yankee Mike Delta Lima 6 Uniform 4. I repeat, the Google Classroom access code is Mike, uh, sorry, Yankee Mike Delta Lima 6 Uniform 4. Have a look on there. Uh, have a look on there, um, and uh, you'll see the uh, the Google Classroom and the other bits and pieces to this. Um, and uh, there will be a copy of the webinar uh, fairly shortly after this. Um, Finally, um, feedback is important. Um, please uh, scan this uh, QR code and uh, give us a, uh, a let us have some uh, information, and we will uh, we will try and let uh, you. Uh, it will help us present these things. Um, I've just had um, two uh, people ask, uh, how do we access the Google Classroom? So I will just go back on this presentation and I'll leave this slide up. I need to come back another one. There we are, the Google Classroom. Is is down there on the bottom of the uh, screen there. So the access code is Yankee Mike Delta Lima 6 Uniform 4. Thank you all very much for listening to today's presentation. There will be another one next week uh, at the same time, and that will be on electronic navigation.